we've considered the olfactory nerve, the sensory nerve, and it's a series of bundles which are sensory in function. We've considered the optic nerve, a sensory nerve, and now we are moving into nerves which are not sensory, but which in fact are motor nerves. And we will consider together number three, the ocular motor, number four, the cochlear, and number six, the abducens nerve. And as with all good motor nerves, you have to ask what muscles they innervate if you're to understand anything about them. So number three, ocular motor. And number four, trochlear. And number six, abducens. First of all, innervate a set of muscles called the extraocular muscles. These are muscles of the orbit that you saw, which lie outside of the actual eyeball itself, hence they are extraocular. These are good American striated muscles. <laughs> they are just like any other striated muscle in the body. There's a few, and, and they're very fast, and they have a very high uh, ratio of innervation per a very great many axons go to each muscle, even though they're small muscles. But aside from that, they are really fundamentally like any other striated muscle that we've come across, and they behave like ones. Uh, the ocular motor innervates, I don't know. I'll have to write them all down to do the, to figure out how many of them are. There must be five or six. Uh, one is the LPS, levator palpebri superioris, a muscle that is extraocular in the sense that it's outside the eyeball, but it doesn't even affect the eyeball. It has nothing to do with the eyeball whatsoever. It just happens to be there in the orbit and goes and elevates the upper lid. We'll be talking a bit about that. And then a whole bunch of muscles that actually do move the eyeball. Medial rectus. This is in no particular order, just as they occur to me. Uh, inferior oblique. Superior rectus. Inferior, I did inferior rectus, didn't I? Uh, don't worry, I'll think of them. Well, I didn't do inferior rectus. I said I did inferior rectus, but I hadn't really done it. Inferior rectus, uh, that may be all of them. Uh, the trochlear nerve does the superior oblique, and that's all it does. Since it's a very tiny nerve, and the abducens nerve does the lateral rectus, and that's all it does. And it is not such a big nerve, though it's a little bit bigger than the trochlear because the lateral rectus is bigger than the superior oblique. And I said, I got them all, medial rectus, superior rectus, lateral rectus, inferior rectus, inferior oblique, so that's it. So that is, these are the strided extraocular muscles done by these nerves. Now, very importantly, the ocular motor is not purely a somatic motor nerve. Trochlear is purely somatic motor. Abducens is purely somatic motor. But ocular motor is also one of several cranial nerves that carry preganglionic parasympathetic axons out of the brain in them. They travel in these nerves as they exit the brain. Of course, the one you know about best is the vagus. But the ocular motor, and a few others we'll be talking about later, are other cranial nerves that have preganglionic parasympathetic axons leaving the brain with them. And these preganglionic parasympathetic axons in the ocular motor travel into the orbit with, the, with it, go into its inferior division, and then leave the inferior division and go to a ganglion, very hard to see in dissection. Some of you may have seen it. I was unsuccessful this year in finding any. Anybody up there find any this year? Susan found one. So she'll be glad to show you the one she found. Or <laughs> uh, you pointing to me? I can't show you. It's a tiny, tiny little ganglion. It sits on the lateral surface of the optic nerve, sandwiched between the optic nerve and the proximal part of lateral rectus, called the ciliary ganglion. And the preganglionic parasympathetic fibers synapse on the cells of the ciliary ganglion. 
So it's a parasympathetic ganglion that is not embedded in the wall of the organ. It's real out there and can be dissected. And the uh, cells of the ciliary ganglion send postganglionic parasympathetic axons in short ciliary nerves to pierce the eyeball and to innervate some smooth muscle that is within the eyeball itself. Now, they innervate some vasculature of the eyeball. That's a minor point. Well, it's not minor for the blood vessels, but for us it is. <laughs> but the important things that, from a clinical point of view that they innervate are two muscles, one called the sphincter pupillae, And you'll read in core sometimes the term constrictor pupillae for the same muscle, and I don't know why. You know, I tried for all the years of my life, until about two years ago, I called it the constrictor pupillae. And just this morning I thought, well, maybe, you know, there's a common term, and check which is the most common, constrictor pupillae or sphincter pupillae. And I went online, and you don't find anybody in the world who calls it constrictor pupillae. You know, like three citations in Medline versus 80 or 90 for a sphincter. And then I went to the textbook I used as a student, and I couldn't find a constrictor pupillae. And I went to the, the sector. I, I can't find anywhere where I came up with this term. So I don't know why I used it for 30 years, but I did. <laughs> but it appears in core as a result of that sometimes. But everybody else on Earth in, in the next revision of core will only use the term sphincter pupillae. All right? And that's a muscle which causes your pupil to get smaller. All right? And that causes it to get smaller in response to two things. Light, if you shine light in a person's eye, looking for an eraser. If you shine light in an eye, the pupil of that eye gets smaller to protect, I guess, the retina from excessive light. And the pupil of the opposite eye gets smaller too. And when you stimulate one side of the body, but the response that you get is on both sides. That's called a consensual response. Consensual. And the, the reflex of the constriction of the pupil when the light is exposed to eye is called the pupillary light reflex. So that's not too hard to. So the pupillary light reflex, constriction of the pupil when light is shown in your eye, is a consensual reflex in that both the stimulated and the unstimulated side respond. The other smooth muscle of the eye, innervated by the oculomotor nerve, is called the ciliary muscle. The ciliary muscle is a muscle that, and I'll show you a video on this, when it contracts, allows the lens to get rounder. The lens normally wants to be a fairly round structure, but is held stretched out, it's held flatter normally by tension on its periphery from something called the suspensory ligament of the <coughs> lens or the ciliary zonule. When this ciliary muscle contracts, it relieves tension on this suspensory ligament, and the lens then naturally assumes the shape it wants to assume which is a rounder shape, and it can refract light or, uh, more severely or, or more, it just bends the light more. Now, when you go to look at something that's close to you, the ciliary muscle contracts. That's called, that process is called accommodation. You're trying to accommodate to something being brought close to you. It just so happens that when you try to look at something close to you, not only does the ciliary muscle contract, but so does the sphincter pupillae. And so then the, there is another reflex called the accommodation reflex, which causes your pupil to get smaller. Not just the pupillary light reflex, but there's a pupillary accommodation reflex as well. So the pupil gets smaller mainly under these two circumstances, bright light or trying to look at something close to you. And now I will show you, oh, I think this comes down, uh, some videos about showing you, probably explained to you better than I just did, uh, about, yes? Uh, is there a sympathetic uh, innervation that counteracts the uh, action? The question is, is there a sympathetic innervation that counteracts it? And the answer is, 
uh, not to the ciliary muscle. The ciliary muscle either is stimulated to contract or not stimulated, in which case it relaxes all by itself, but doesn't need an active relaxer. And there is sympathetic innervation to a different muscle of the iris called the dilator pupillae, which causes your pupil to get bigger. But you can, in fact, stimulate the sphincter and cause the pupil to get smaller and simply stop it, and the pupil will, under, I guess, some electronic stimulation of the dilator, will, will go back in size to what it was. But the, all right, so here we go. This is a movie. This is, I'm giving credit to the people who came up with this movie, as I should. Human eye behaves much like a camera. The adjustment for near vision includes three events occurring simultaneously. They are known as the accommodation reflex, or the near triad. Each event will be illustrated separately. First, as an object approaches, both eyes track it in a process called convergence. The size of the eyes in this example has been greatly exaggerated so that the subtle movement that takes place during convergence can be seen. Convergence of the eyes keeps the image of the object of interest centered on the fovea, the part of the retina where resolution is highest. If the eyes do not converge appropriately, diplopia, or double vision, occurs. Second, the pupil must constrict to restrict the entry of light rays diverging from a near object, since diverging rays cannot be bent enough by the periphery of the lens to make them fall on the fovea. If the pupil were to remain dilated, the image would be blurred. Finally, the shape of the lens must change, increasing its refractive index so that the light rays passing through it converge on the fovea. In distance vision, the lens is pulled at its equator by the suspensory ligament, so that it is relatively thin. When the muscles of the ciliary body contract, the tension on the suspensory ligament decreases, and this allows the lens to assume a rounder shape, increasing its power to bend light. As a result, the image is focused on the fovea. All right, so that gives you a nicer presentation of what I said. And here is how one tests for the function of the sphincter pupillae. You cannot test for the function of the ciliary muscle. I imagine you could if you had the right apparatus that could somehow measure you know, the refractive index of your lens. But this is not the kind of thing you can just do casually. So in casual examination, you simply test for the function of sphincter pupillae, both in response to stimulation by light and in response to the attempt to accommodate to a close object. Pupillary light reflex is also partly from the optic nerve. It uh, supplies the afferent limb, whereas the oculomotor nerve supplies the efferent limb. And uh, the pupils are assessed in a dim light. Before you actually do the pupillary light reflex, you may want to actually inspect the pupils. First, observe the pupils. Pupils should be round, regular, and equal. Typically, they are between 3 and 5 millimeters in size in a normal individual. Also observe the position of the lid. If the lid covers part or all of the pupil with the patient looking straight ahead, tulsis or lid droop is present. And Rika's eyes are perfectly symmetrical. So, we assess the pupillary light response by shining a bright light in the eyes, and we would dim the lights. And the pupillary response is assessed by shining a light in one eye. Observe, as I shine in the right eye, the right eye constricts. That is the direct response. Now observe Andrika's left eye as I shine the light in the right eye. That is the consensual response. That is, the opposite eye reacting in response. Finally, you should test the swinging flashlight test by shining the eye first in the right, then in the left. <laughs> I'm going to explain to you why you do that. And observing. Uh, it's not obvious from what you said why you do that, but I will explain that after we see the end of the video. constricting bilaterally. We also assess for the near response by having the patient accommodate. This is accomplished by asking Andrika to look into the distance and then look at the tip of her nose. Please look off into the distance 
and follow this item as it approaches your face. And we can see that not only do Enrica's eyes converge, but her pupils also constrict. If the patient has any difficulty following that command, you could ask them to follow their own thumb. Look at your thumb over here. Now bring it towards your nose and keep looking at it. Just bring it a little higher. And then, excellent. Okay, so this is in fact uh, something that one always does, test uh, pupillary light reflex, pupillary accommodation reflex. Now, you saw our friend the doctor do what's called the swinging flashlight test. And the swinging flashlight test is actually not a test of the pupillary sphincter muscle. It's in fact a test of the retina or optic nerve. And here is the logic behind it, and then I'm going to show you how it's done and what a person and a person who has a problem with. When you shine light, let's say you shine light in my right eye, and if my right eye and left eye are both functioning perfectly, both pupils will constrict. And then you swing it to my left eye, and it will the pupil will start to dilate a little as the light is being swung across. Then you shine the light in my left eye, and the pupils constrict again. That's the way it should be. But let us say, in fact, that I had a real problem with the retina or the optic nerve on my left side, so that light seemed very dim on my left eye compared to how bright it seemed in my normal right eye. If I shine light in my right eye, the normal eye, both pupils constrict. When I swing it to the left eye, the left eye's retina or optic nerve is not functioning properly. It doesn't see the light as bright. It sees it, in fact, as much dimmer than it had been before, and then the pupil will dilate. So this is an odd response. You shine light one eye, both pupils constrict. You swing it to the other eye, both pupils dilate. That means that the second eye is not seeing light as brightly as the first eye is. And that is a, really a test of the retina or optic nerve in the second eye when you do this. Now this is done then as a test of the optic nerve, not as a test of the, of the ocular motor nerve. Here's going to be, I'm going to explain this in advance, you're going to see a person who has some kind of damage to his left eye's retina or optic nerve. When light is shined in the right eye, it's seen as very bright. When it's shifted to the left eye, it's seen as dimmer, and the pupils start to dilate. And what this individual is going to try and do is to find out what is the difference, what the doctor is trying to do is find out what is the difference between these eyes. So they're going to put a filter here that first filters the, the amount of light that goes into the right eye. And they'll find out that that removes 10% you know, of the light. I'm making that number up. But still when they swing it, this eye is seeing less so it dilates. Then they're going to put a stronger filter, which filters out even more of the light going into the right eye. Then they're going to put yet a stronger filter until they finally find out a filter that removes so much light from the good right eye that it is now essentially seeing what the left eye sees in terms of brightness. I hope that I hope I didn't confuse you more than now. But you'll you'll see this. Is the the video is on the line too, so you can look at. Yes. So if you start at the other eye, you will get a, a normal response. In fact, the constriction will be even greater. You have to do both. Absolutely, you have to do both on a swinging flashlight case. You have to go from one side to the other to make sure that in, in no case. Does the pupil ever dilate? All right, so again, the right eye is the good eye. They're going to try and dim the amount of eye going into the right eye until it's dimmed so much that its perception is comparable to what the bad left eye is. When you have a pupil that is, dilates because the retina or the optic nerve is not seeing light very brightly, that's referred to as an afferent pupillary defect. That means the problem is in the sensory side of the, of the reflex, the optic nerve or retina, as opposed to an efferent pupillary defect, which would be in the oculomotor side. This young man has a resolving optic neuritis, and you can see that he has an afferent pupillary defect on the left. We're putting a small filter over the right eye to try and balance that defect, and you can see that when the light is shined in the left eye, there's still a dilation, indicating that there's not enough filter placed over the normal eye. Now a 0.6 log unit filter is placed over the right eye. And again, you can see that 
it's not quite large enough to balance this defect. I want to point out that in between each testing, what you need to do is to re-bleach the amount of light entering both eyes, as I'm doing here, and that's to prevent any asymmetric bleaching of the eyes while the filter has been placed over it. We're getting close. See, with that final filter, they got to the point where it didn't dilate anymore. It didn't actually constrict when it, when it was swung to the left side. But at least the left side didn't dilate anymore, even because they blocked so much light going into the right eye that the, uh, the left and the right saw it as approximately the same level. All right, so that's... Uh, that's just the way to judge... Like how much damage? There That's is. how they judge how much damage. That's right. They find out the filter, and I don't know what these log units mean, and, but someone who's an ophthalmologist or a neurologist will know at some point, well, you've lost 50% you know, of the function of you. Now, this person was said to have a, a resolving optic neuritis, which means an inflammatory condition of the left optic nerve uh, that is getting better. And maybe what they're doing is, do it, maybe they do this at intervals to see how rapidly the person is improving because that filter number should get lower and lower uh, the, be the better the person gets. Was there another question? No? Yeah. Yeah, there was. Sorry. How would you determine between a retinal damage and an optic nerve damage? The question is how do you determine between damage to the retina and the optic nerve? And the answer is I don't know. All right. Now, you know that the pupil constriction response to light, pupillary light reflex, the pupil constriction response to trying to accommodate or looking at something that's close to you, the pupillary accommodation reflex. Why do you test them both? You say if it works, it works. The fact is they are handled by different parts of the brain, different nuclei in the brain. And you can get a pupil that responds to accommodation, but not to light. All right? And that is called an argyl, argyl or Argyle, I think it's Argyle, Robertson pupil. Now, yeah, Willie, they'll probably give the name here and see how it's pronounced. I already say Argyle. Argyle Robertson pupil is a pupil, and this I use a mnemonic device for. Argyle Robertson begins with AR. To me, the only way I can remember which one that pupil responds to is realizing that AR is also the first letters of accommodation reactive. So an Argyle Robertson pupil is accommodation reactive, but not light reactive. And this occurs, you'll see what this person has, uh, because this is probably the, the most common cause of it, though there can be other causes. People have an Argyle Robertson pupil in a patient with neurosyphilis. You see, with light being shined in either eye, there's minimal, if any, constriction of the pupils. Not a very con convincing light response, but look how small those pupils are to begin with. That's characteristic of an Argyle Robertson pupil. Now what we're doing is turning the light on and off. And again, I don't think there's any convincing pupillary response. What we're going to do here is to ask the patient to look at the finger as it approaches his nose, evoking his near response. Now look, those pupils are constricting to near. What you can see is when he looks off in the distance, they dilate, proving that they were constricted to near. Here we go again. Watch those pupils. I think you can see them constricting a bit. Okay. So that's why you do both of them, is because you're looking for diseases of the brain, neurosyphilis being the, the most common. I don't know how common it is among your audience, but uh, at any rate, it does, in fact, there are other conditions, and so you always look for asymmetry between the pupillary light reflex and the pupillary accommodation reflex. Thanks, sir. Yes, sir. Will Argyle Robertson always affect both eyes or one eye only? Uh, you know, it, 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 well, yes. The answer is, does it affect both eyes? And the answer is yes. Both eyes, it does not produce an asymmetry. Yeah, that's, that's the fundamental question you're asking. All right, so enough of pupils, enough of the parasympathetic component of the oculomotor nerve and also obviously a bit about the optic we learned. And now just let's think about the eye uh, as a general, for a moment, a general photoreceptive organ. When your eye is perfectly shaped, right, it is said to be emetropic. Emetropia is the condition of having, emetros is Greek for meaning suitably proportioned. 
So if your eye is perfectly shaped, it's said to be emetropic, your eye. And that means that if you're looking off at something at a great distance, so that the light coming from it is essentially the light rays can be treated as if they were parallel to one another, those light rays will come in, be ref uh, reflected by the lens, and will focus precisely on the fovea. And so you will see distant objects at in perfect focus. Emetropic eyes see distant objects at perfect focus without doing anything. <coughs> what happens when the object moves closer to an emetropic eye? Well, obviously, if the person doesn't do anything, the light rays now diverge as opposed to approaching the eye parallel. They diverge from one another. They are bent by the lens and the cornea. The cornea is an important thing that bends light as well, but if you can't change the shape of your cornea at will. You can change the shape of your lens. Uh, these uh, these uh, light rays would focus somewhere here way behind the fovea, and that means everything would look blurry to you. So what does the emetropic person do in order to see objects brought closer to her or him? Contracts the ciliary muscle, releasing tension on these ligaments, the suspensory ligament of the lens, often called the or ciliary zonule. The lens gets rounder. You saw that in the picture of the, uh, the uh, movie. And the light rays are bent more, and they now focus on the fovea. And this is how eyes are supposed to work. Here is, a, again, a picture of the emetropic eye, the perfect eye that focuses things seen at a great distance without doing anything. Here is an eye that's too short. Not everybody has emetropic eyes. Some people's eyes are shorter than nature intended them to be. This person starts to look at distance, tries to look at distant objects, and they are blurry because the focus point is behind the fovea. What can this person do to focus on this object? Hmm? Squint. Squint. Squinting accomplishes a great many useful things in the world. <laughs> but I don't want that, excuse me, as an answer to any of these questions. <laughs> And in fact, I'm not sure squinting works in this case. You're probably on your side. But there's a more obvious thing the person can do. Yeah, can, 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 can use the ciliary muscle to release tension on the suspensory ligament, allow the lens to get rounder, and now the focus is back on the fovea again. So this person can easily see objects at a great distance, even though the eye is too short, they just have to use the ciliary muscle when a emetropic person would not have to use the ciliary muscle. That brings a certain cost with it, not in energy consumption, which is in not, use, not measurable. And the cost is this. This is what happens when an object moves close to an eye that is too short, in which the ciliary muscle had already contracted, just so they could see distant objects. The ciliary muscle can't contract anymore. It's been contracted so that person could focus on distant objects. That's, that means that lens is as round as it's going to get when looking at distant objects. So you bring the object close to the person, the light rays diverge more. They cannot be focused on the trophy anymore. So that's a person who can see things at a distance but cannot see things brought close to them. And you know, without wearing glasses, what can a person do to focus on these? The answer is nothing. There's nothing without glasses you can do to focus on. And that such people like that who have short eyes are said to be hyperopic. Uh, they have hyperopia, but of course we all said that they're farsighted. That's the name. Farsightedness is when your eyes are too short, you can round up your lens to see distant objects, but as they get closer, your lens is already as round as it's going to get. You cannot focus on things brought close to you. So you can see things far away without lenses. Here's an emetropic eye again. Here is the, an eye that is too long, the opposite of our uh, hyperopic eye, an eye that is too long. What, without bearing glasses, what can this person do to focus on a distant object? Don't say squint, which is actually works. <laughs> Any other thing besides squinting? Well, you we all have nothing to say about this because nothing can be done. Without, there's nothing you can do to move the focal point backwards. Your lens is only capable of moving your focal point more towards the front of the eye. You have nothing in your eye that can move the focal point backwards. So this person cannot ever see distant objects 
clearly without using some kind of uh, alternate mechanism like an eyeglass or squinting, which uh, reflects, refracts the light as well. So, on the other hand, what can this person do to focus on anything? Well, that person wants to focus on something, got to bring that object close to them. Now the light rays diverge. The lens hasn't bothered to change shape because the eyeball was too long, so you didn't have to bother to change shape of your lens. You just uh, now, by bringing the object closer to you, the light rays are diverging, and then they do end up focusing. That moves, that moves the focal point backwards. <coughs> the uh, object is now focused on the fovea. So if you can see things, you cannot see things at a distance. But you can see things in focus as they're brought closer and closer to you because your eye was too long. You are said to be myopic. That's probably what you have. All people who, who can squint or put their, or look through little slits and things like that are, are myopic by and large. Uh, and uh, these people are said to be nearsighted because they can see things that are brought close to them, but cannot see things which are far away. So that's the basis of myopia and hyperopia. Uh, nearsightedness and farsightedness, shape of eye. Understand? Yes. Uh, why does squinting help in vision? Because it, it's it's not you know the, it's when you put a narrow slit for some in, light rays are diffracted or refracted or there's some anybody physicist here, light rays are changed when they go through a narrow slit. I don't know whether they're bent up or bent down or whatever, but they are changed. So you're using just it's like a, it's like a lens. But it's not a lens because, uh, uh, but, you know, light rays do things when they go through narrow slits. And I don't, that's why you can do it. it. They do things for myopic people that help them. All right, so here's an emetropic person who is quite old. But looking at a distance, this person can focus fine because the light rays do go right onto the fovea. But when this old person tries to look at something close to him, <laughs> The ciliary muscle does indeed contract. That's the accommodation, the attempt to accommodate. The ciliary zonule does indeed relax. But as you get older, your lens can, loses its elasticity. It doesn't round up anymore. It stays as flat as it was, even without any tension on it. And therefore, as this object is brought closer, try as it might, the ciliary muscle does not cause the lens to get any rounder and the focal point is behind the eye and gets out of focus. So this person is farsighted in a way, in a sense, and cannot see objects brought close, but not because of the eye shape is different, it's because the lens is too rigid to round up. This particular type of farsightedness that comes with old age, that you will all experience exactly on your 40th birthday, exactly. <laughs> I mean, uh, Susan will tell you, well, not Susan hasn't quite reached it, but something for you to look forward to. But it, it happens, just you wake up one morning and that's it. You cannot focus on things close to you. Uh, that's called presbyopia. In the old days, it was called senile presbyopia, which I actually thought had a nice ring to it. But now, because we're also conscious not to insult anybody, we just call it presbyopia. That is the farsightedness that comes with old age. What? All right. Jack, yes. Why is it that uh, even when you you got this, you if you were if you're nearsighted. nearsighted to start with, you could still focus. Well, on that's you. because nearsighted people can focus without on close things without letting their lens without get round. Okay. So without. if you can focus on something near without rounding up your lens, in fact, you can't round it up anymore. Doesn't doesn't hurt you. Uh, where was I here? All right. All right. So now let's get into the extraocular muscles. The first one we're talking about is levator palpebris superioris, but because it's the easiest one. Levator palpebris superioris does exactly what its name suggests. It raises your upper lid. All right? And uh, if it is denervated because of damage to the ocular motor nerve or even the branch, which would be very unlikely, the, but damage to the ocular motor is not unlikely at all, but damage to the branch of the levator palpebris superioris would be, you have what this, uh, our doctor friend referred to as ptosis. Uh, let me spell it out for you, just in case, because it's not spelled as, as it's pronounced, because it has a T in it. Ptosis. That just, ptosis just means drooping. So you can have a lot of things which are tonic in this world, but if the upper lid is drooping, that's called upper lid ptosis, or superior palpebral ptosis. 
That's what happens if your levator palpebra superioris is paralyzed. It usually is very pronounced. So pronounced that, in fact, the lid usually covers the uh, pupil, and so that you can't see anything out of the eye. Uh, when you ask the person to look up, <coughs> follow your finger going up, the lid doesn't move. That lid is that upper lid, that levator palpebra superioris muscle is paralyzed. Generally, when you ask a person to follow, follow a finger moving up, both eyelids elevate. Well, in fact, the good eyelid, which isn't paralyzed, will elevate, but the bad one just stays where it is, <coughs> grouped down over, uh, usually over the pupil. So that's something. We'll see this later on. But that's what happens when your levator palpebra superioris is paralyzed. The other muscles are, in fact, considerably more complex uh, that's, I was just going to say that at this point. And now we have to talk about position of the eye and the various axes. And I had, I had emails about this uh, in the last couple of days about eye muscles and can you tell me about why, why this muscle is this and that. Questions in lab about it and I kept on saying wait till today because this is a complicated topic. And for me to write you know, a three paragraph email is, is too much effort on my part. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the position of the primary position. This is by definition. Primary position of eye is two, an eye that's looking straight forward. The optic axes of the two eyes are parallel, looking straight forward out into the distance. That's referred to as the primary position of your eyes. An eyeball can rotate around three mutually orthogonal axes. One is the anteroposterior axis, which is called the optic axis. One is the medial lateral axis, which is just called that. And one is the superior inferior axis, superior inferior axis, which is, has that name, no other name. It can rotate around each of these three axes independently. If an, ax, if an eyeball rotates around the medial lateral axis, that produces elevation if it rotates up around that axis. And that's called elevation of the eye or depression of the eye if they're rotating downwards around the medial lateral axis. If eyeballs are rotating around the supero-inferior axis, that produces adduction if they move medially around that axis, and produces abduction. This, no one can do this. <laughs> but it doesn't make any difference. I've allowed both eyes to rotate laterally around a supero-inferior axis, and that lateral rotation around a supero-inferior axis is called abduction. Extra? Yes. Why can't we do that? We can't do it because in your brain, the nucleus, the nuclei, I'm not sure if it's two or, or one, that control eyeball movements, make sure the eyeballs move in what are called conjugate movements, in the same way that you cannot elevate one and depress the other. The, the brain controls the way eyeballs move, and it always makes sure they, they, they work together. So there is no... Uh, nuclear, there's no nucleus that would allow, there's no command from the brain that would allow you to do it. Anatomically, there's no reason you couldn't, but there's no command from the brain that would. Uh, then there's the possibility of rotating around the optic axis, uh, around the anteroposterior axis. And you're not, if you look at a person's eye and it rotates around that axis, you're not going to see anything, all right? So you have to put a, you'd have to mark the iris, or you'd have to see a little fleck in the iris to see how it changed position. So I have now taken this person's iris and drawn a red line, a vertical red line, through the iris. So we can see which way the eyeball is rotating around an anteroposterior axis. And if it rotates so that the top or superior pole of the eyeball moves medially, that is referred to as encycloduction. And if the eye rotates so that the superior pole moves laterally around this anteroposterior axis, that is referred to as X cycloduction. So we have the cardinal movements of the eyeball, elevation, depression, adduction, abduction, in cycloduction, X cycloduction. That covers all possible movements around the three axes. Now let's take a look at what the muscles of the eye do and the effect they have on these six cardinal movements. The simplest muscles of the eye are the medial and lateral rectus muscles. They operate only really around up. Oh, yeah. uh, when you look at something pulling on a globe or, glo or a globular structure, it's the surface acts like a pulley. 
So in the same way that if you have a rope around a pulley and pull down it, the vector that this rope applies is not applied at this point. It's not an upward vector like that. In fact, it's a downwards vector like that. You put the vector where the rope leaves the surface of the pulley. That's how you analyze mechanically things which are wrapped around surfaces. The vector is applied where the, where the, where the object leaves the surface. So that's where I'm going to put my vectors where the muscles leave contact with the surface of the globe of the eye. So here are the vectors for the medial rectus muscle and the lateral rectus muscle. They both insert way up here around the front of the eye, but they wrap around the eye like this and then the muscles leave at that point, so that's where you apply the vectors. They rotate only around this one axis, which is coming in and out of the plane of the blackboard. That's the superior inferior axis. I've indicated here medial lateral, and I've indicated anteroposterior as well. Here's the nasal side. Here's the uh, ear side or temporal side. So these muscles, in fact, only exert a torque around the optic axis, or I'm sorry, around the supero inferior axis. They only exert a torque around the supero inferior axis. When the medial rectus contracts, it causes the eyeball to adduct. This is pretty obvious. And when the lateral rectus contracts, it causes the eye to abduct. All right, medial adductor, lateral abductor. Now let's take a look at some more complicated muscles, superior rectus and inferior rectus. And here are their vectors applied to the point of the eye where they leave contact with its surface. In the dark green eye is superior rectus. And in the pale green, hidden from view, really, by the eyeball a little bit, is the inferior rectus. Let's take a look at superior rectus and what it does. It's clear that it has a, uh, has a, a, uh, a torque around the supero-inferior axis, but it also has a torque around another axis as well around the anterior axis, as we'll see. When I resolve the superior rectus into its components, there is a reason that, require, that you are required to take physics and in, in get into medical school, and it's just for this lecture and this lecture. <laughs> so you take this vector, the vector pull of the superior rectus, you draw its components, and then you get rid of it. You replace it by its components. That's what you do in vector mechanics. And you ask yourself, what do each of these components do? And it's very clear that the long, posteriorly directed component of the superior rectus has a torque because it's applied to the top surface of the eyeball, applied to the top surface of the eyeball, uh, that will cause the eyeball to elevate. And that is a motion around the medial lateral axis. Uh, it also has the medial component has a moment around the anteroposterior axis that will cause the eye to encycloduct. Now, in fact, it does have a slight adductory effect as well, but that is trivial for all real purposes of eye motion. We can discuss it later if you want to. The important and the big leverages is the leverage of the posterior component around the medial lateral axis producing elevation and the medial component around an anteroposterior axis causing encycloduction. Inferior rectus, same direction, resolve into its components, and now we have a posteriorly directed force applied to the undersurface of the eye. A posteriorly directed force applied to the undersurface, and that produces depression of the eye. And a medially directed force applied to the undersurface, and that produces excycloduction. Again, it does have some adductory effect, which I wish to ignore for the moment, So, the, because it's small. Uh, so the major effects of the rectus muscle, inferior rectus, is depression and excycloduction, whereas the major effect of the superior rectus was elevation in cycloduction. If we look at the oblique muscles, superior oblique and then sort of hidden largely from view, the inferior oblique, in dark red, the superior oblique pull applied to the top surface of the eye. In pale red or pink, the inferior obliques pull applied to the undersurface of the eye. We resolve the superior oblique into its vector components. We now have an anteriorly directed vector applied to the top surface of the eye, and that will produce depression of the eye. 
and we have a medially directed vector applied to the top surface of the eye, and that will produce in cycloadduction. And in fact, probably it's a better in cycloadductor, or certainly an equal in cycloadductor as the presser. Whereas the superior and inferior rectus muscles were a little bit better at elevation and depression than they were at in cycloducting and <coughs> cycloducting. This is equal or even better cycloductor. Here's the inferior rectus muscle. Inferior oblique. Inferior oblique. Thank you. Keep, keep on correcting me, because if you don't, they're going to get screwed up, not just me. It's bad enough if I'm screwed up, but you're it's even worse if you are. So please do keep on correcting me. This is the inferior oblique muscle. Its vector components. It has an anteriorly directed vector applied to the undersurface of the eye, and a medially directed vector applied to the undersurface of the eye. And the anteriorly directed vector applied to the undersurface will produce elevation. And the medially directed vector applied to the undersurface will produce excycloduction. And again, the excycloduction is as much or more than the elevation effect. So we've got these four muscles, the superior rectus, inferior rectus, superior oblique and inferior oblique. But unlike the medial and lateral rectus, which have pure actions, which we love because they are pure, these muscles have both elevation, depression, and cycloduction actions. And a muscle that does both of them, that moves up and down and cycloduction, is called a cyclovertical muscle. That's the name given to these four muscles. They're called cyclovertical muscles because they do both up and down and cycloductions. Now, here's the thing. Cycloductions are bad. Cycloductions, for the most part, are bad for one very obvious reason. When you, if your eyes start to spin in the orbit, you're going to see the world is spinning. And you don't want to see the world is spinning. So the whole idea of using your eyes is to use them and avoid all the cycloductions you can. So the world doesn't appear to be spinning, even though it isn't. So you have to figure out how to use these muscles so that they, they don't cycloduct. That's why it's hard. This is one way. You could do it, all right? Here's an eye that's adducted about 50 degrees by the medial rectus. Medial rectus doesn't have a cycloductory effect. It's a pure adductor. But when the eye is adducted 50 degrees, look what happens to the vectors of the superior and inferior oblique muscle. They line up now with the optic axis. They line up with the optic axis. And when they contract, they will only produce elevation and depression. They will no longer cycloduct because they will have no leverage around the optic axis. Look what's happened to the superior and inferior rectus. They are now almost at right angles to the optic axis. They are almost pure in cycloductors and excycloductors. So by adducting the eye this amount, you can turn the obliques into virtually pure elevators and depressors, and you almost eliminate usefulness of the rectus muscles. Look at it. So this is how you draw the chart. This is what's in all neurology and ophthalmology textbooks. Here's an eyeball, nose, ear. That makes it the right, no, left eye, doesn't it? Yes, left eye. You adduct it using the medial rectus. When you do so, you remove the cycloductory effects of the obliques, and therefore you can use the inferior oblique to elevate an eye and the superior oblique to depress an eye without cycloduction. <coughs> Let's say you adduct the eye 25 degrees. When you do that, you now align the superior and inferior rectus vectors with the optic axis. They become pure elevators and depressors. On the other hand, the obliques now are almost pure cycloductors, useless to you virtually. So if you want to use the lateral rectus to abduct the eye, you may then use the superior rectus to elevate it without cycloduction. <coughs> and the inferior rectus to depress it without cycloduction. This is the standard chart for how you know what muscles do. All right, so you will, be, you will have to know this chart. Now, this is great. I now have a way of looking inwards, up and down, and looking inwards, up and down, or outwards, up and down, and avoiding cycloductions. That's not good if I want to look straight ahead, up and down, which I do probably much of my life. So to look straight ahead, you use a combination of inferior oblique and superior rectus. They are both elevator muscles. But the superior rectus is an in cycloductor, and the inferior oblique is an ex cycloductor. And you balance out their forces so that the cycloductory effects 
balance and negate one another and eliminate one another. And then you can now look straight up and down by using an elevator in cycloducter and an elevator ex cycloducter simultaneously. And if you want to look straight downward, you do it by using a depressor in cycloducter that's superior oblique and a depressor ex cycloducter that's inferior rectus. And the ex cycloducting and in cycloducting effects cancel one another, and you just get pure depression of the eye looking straight ahead. So you always, for these cyclovertical muscles, they have to be used in combinations either with medial and lateral rectus or with each other to eliminate the cycloductory effects. Uh, there's one thing I want to say about this that in a way is the most important thing to say, and that is when your eye is abducted, the vertical position of the eye is controlled by the rectus, superior and inferior rectus. When your eye is adducted, the vertical position is controlled by your obliques. That's very important from a clinical point of view. The vertical position of the abducted eye is controlled by the superior and inferior rectus. The vertical position of an adducted eye is controlled by the obliques. Now, here's how you examine extraocular muscles. Next is the assessment of extraocular movements. When we assess for these, we're not only assessing the ocular motor nerve, but also the fourth, or trochlear nerve, and sixth, abducens nerve. First, the patient is asked to direct their eyes to the right. Look to the right, please. To the left. Look up. And look down. Then they are asked to follow a target as we assess their pursuit. Please follow this pen. Laterally to the left. Laterally to the right. Vertically up. And vertically down. Then when looking to the left. Vertically up and vertically down. So when looking to the left, the up and down tests the superior and inferior rectus of her left eye and the superior and inferior oblique of her right eye. And when looking to the right, vertically up and vertically down. And when looking to the right, you are then testing the superior and inferior rectus of her right eye and the superior and inferior oblique of her left eye. So you can test the individual muscles by get, having the person look to one side up and down, and the other side up and down. When one of these muscles, or a group of them, become paralyzed, it becomes essentially impossible for your optic axes to converge, the right and the left optic axes to converge on the same point that you want to look at. When your optic axes cannot be brought to converge on what you want to look at, that's called strabismus. Your business is failure to be able to converge your optic axes on what you want to look at. All right? If that strabismus is greater than two or three degrees, that is, if they, they should be right always hitting the object perfectly, if one of them is just two or three degrees off, then you get double vision because then the image uh, on one eye is so far removed from where it should be that your brain can't fuse the two images. And that means with severe, well, not even severe strabismus, because to be off by two or three degrees is not very much at all. So with most strabismuses, strabismi, or whatever the plural is of it, uh, you get diplopia, which is double vision. Let's take a look at some strabismi. I wish I, wish I knew what the plural was. Someone can find that out for me. Uh, here is a person with damage to the oculomotor nerve. This person does not have to worry about double vision. All right? This person doesn't have to. Which, which eye do you think is, which, which side do you think the oculomotor injury is on? Uh, yeah, the person's left eye. That was a very difficult question you answered excellently. All right. I mean, this is a case of a person whose levator palpebra superior is totally paralyzed. This eye, upper eyelid, is totally tonic, if, that's, if you can be totally tonic. Uh, sometimes they're not quite that low, but this person is, so you don't have to worry about double vision because you can't see out of the left eye. To, to show that, it is, uh, that he's got problems with more than just his levator palpebrae superioris, you'll see what they do. You lift up the eyelid, and you see there's a very obvious strabismus there. This guy's optic axes are not pointing in the same direction, all right? And you have the position of the eye that has no, no active muscles controlled by the oculomotor. Well, the most obvious change in position is when you have a paralyzed medial rectus muscle, the lateral rectus dominates in determining the position of your eye, all right? 
No, the eye gets swept out by the lateral rectus. You've got a paralyzed superior and inferior rectus, but they're both paralyzed, so the vertical position of the eye doesn't change. You know, they're the muscles. Superior and inferior rectus control the vertical position of an abducted eye. They're both paralyzed, so there's no particular change in the vertical position of this eye. And you can't tell, really, but the pupil should be actually wider, should be, more di should be dilated on this side because this person has no constrictor, no central pupil. In a trochlear nerve palsy, an uh, injury to a trochlear nerve, you have a paralyzed superior oblique muscle. Now, the superior oblique muscle is the muscle that is primarily involved with depressing the adducted eye. If, in fact, it's totally paralyzed, you know, it's also involved in depressing the, the eye in, in looking straight forward, superior oblique. If it's totally paralyzed, you may find that the eye on the side of the total paralysis is slightly elevated, being under control of lacking one of the depressors to hold it in its normal position. If it's only weak and not totally paralyzed, you may not be able to see a vertical deviation of the eye looking straight forward. On the other hand, when the person takes that eye and, and brings it inwards and tries to depress it, that person will not be able to do it. So then you will see, by asking the person to move the eye inwards and asking them to look down, they won't be able to look down if there's a superior oblique paralysis. What is that reflected in terms of the behavior of a person like this? If it's partially or just weakened superior oblique, not completely paralyzed, they complain that they get double vision when they do activities that re require the eye to go in and look down. And the two most common, they, they, they're not saying, I get double vision when I do activities that require the eye to go in and look down. What they tell you when they get double vision, and you will know that it's these activities, because it's double vision in reading and walking downstairs. Reading and walking downstairs cause your eyes to come in and, and drop down. And if one of them can't drop down, then you will get double vision on these sorts of activities. And that is a very diagnostic of a person who has a superior weakness or paralysis. Here is a child with an, uh, an abducens injury. The paralyzed muscle is the lateral rectus. No sound. I'm sure you can figure out which one it is. Yeah, she cannot move her left eye to the side. She cannot move her left eye to the side at all. Now, people with, obviously, people with a lateral rectus uh, paralysis really have a, a pretty bad strabismus most of the time and see double vision most of the time. We'll talk about how you can avoid it. But it's pretty hard. These people are, are really uh, have, have that as a symptom almost all the time. Now, this is just a sort of little diagnostic routine that you can go through if a person has a condition known as hyperopia, that's, uh, sorry, hypertropia. Hyperopia is when your eye, when you're farsighted and your eyeball is too short. This is, and it's annoying, but it's, it's the same sound, a name that sounds similar, but the T cha and TR changes everything. Oh, hypertropia is what you describe a person as having if one of their eyes looks to be higher than the other. Now, this is a strabismus, because the optic axes are obviously not parallel or convergent. All right? Always, you say, you give it the name of to which, which, whichever eye is the highest, that's what it is. So this is, this is a case where the right eye is higher than the left eye. It's called a right hypertropia. All right. uh, you might say to yourself, is the problem that the right eye is abnormally elevated, or is the problem that the left eye is abnormally depressed? I drew it that way on purpose. But because that's the way it really is. In a real patient, it becomes very difficult to tell whether the hypertropic eye is abnormally elevated or the other eye is abnormally depressed. So you have to find a way to figure out which is which. So, weakness of what muscles could account for an abnormally elevated right eye? And I will give you a hint. It is the muscles that depress the, the right eye. Weakness of the depressors would account for an abnormally elevated right eye. So what month is in? Uh, superior oblique and inferior rectus. Very good. Superior oblique and inferior rectus are the depressors of an eye. So weakness of the right-sided 
inferior rectus and superior oblique would cause a right hypertrophia. Weakness of what muscles could account for an abnormally depressed left eye? In case we were wrong, maybe it wasn't a problem with an abnormally elevated right eye. Maybe it was a problem with an abnormally depressed left eye. Weakness of the elevators of the left eye would be the things that cause an abnormal depression of the left eye. So I'm going to zoom again. What muscles, what are the elevators of the left eye that, would, if weak, would cause it to look depressed? Inferior oblique and superior rectus. Very good. Inferior oblique and superior rectus. So now we know that one of, one of these, one or more of these four muscles are involved. Those are the only things that could account for a right hypertrophia. And we have to start eliminating some of them. So we ask the person to look to the right, and the hypertrophia goes away. That means that the muscles controlling the vertical position of an abducted right eye are good and the muscles controlling the vertical position of an adducted left eye are good. So which muscles are good in the right eye? The superior and inferior rectus, good. And obviously the muscles which are good in the left eye are the superior and inferior oblique. So that means that we know that we can eliminate the right inferior rectus from our consideration and the left inferior oblique from our consideration because we proved that the obliques of the left eye and the superior and inferior recti, the vertical recti, as they are called, of the right eye are fine. We ask the person to look in the opposite direction, and now we see the hypertropia is even worse. And it looks actually pretty clearly that it's the right eye that is abnormally elevated. Now we know that the vertical recti, superior and inferior rectus, control the position of this abducted left eye, and the obliques control the vertical position of this adducted right eye. So since this left eye is normal, that left superior rectus must be fine. So this tells us right off the bat, and not right off the bat, but it told us just going through these little maneuvers that the problem was with this person's right superior oblique. And that's why they had the right hypertrophy to start with, and we were able to eliminate or get down to which muscle it is. Now, having said that test, and, and, this is, and these are good tests for the, for the uh, superior oblique muscle. There's yet a better test for, the, for an oblique muscle paralysis, and it's called the Bilshowski head tilt test. And it was Jill, Jill Mann here, who wants to be an ophthalmologist. She didn't come to this lecture? All right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, it's because the last time I, I had a student, I mean, I, this is probably the only anatomy course in the country that teaches the Bill Shotsky head tilt test, which tells you how important it is, right? <laughs> but, I, but I had a student who went home and whose uncle or brother or something was an ophthalmologist, and she said, you know, I just learned about the Bill Shotsky head, head tilt test today, and the person just went, it was ecstatic to think that somebody actually taught this in first year anatomy. But it's just an interesting test because you know, you, everything is memory, but not all things are. Some things are actually problem solving. The Bilshowski head tilt test relies on the information that there is one circumstance in which cycloductions are not bad for you. And that is in a normal person, such as I, <laughs> if I tilt my head so that my right ear gets close to my right shoulder. I actually rotate my eyeballs about eight degrees in the opposite direction to minimize the perception of the world turning around me. Everybody does this, not just me. All right. So this is an active attempt by my right-sided incycloductors and my left-sided excycloductors to rotate my eyes in the opposite direction. And if I go obviously to this side, it's my left-sided incycloductors and my right-sided excycloductors. They do that to produce a counter-rotation of about eight degrees. Now, let us say that I had a paralyzed, or weak, a weak, better, superior oblique of the right side, all right? I tilt my head like this. My right-sided incycloductors are trying to work. One of them is the superior oblique, which is a major incycloductor, but it's weak. The other one is the superior rectus, a major encycloductor, and it's strong. What happens is 
that the superior oblique and, and superior rectus, which normally would counteract elevation and depression, can't, the, the superior oblique becomes overwhelmed by the strong superior rectus, and my eyeball elevates. I'll say it again, maybe in a way that could be understood. All right. <laughs> I tilt my head to this side. I want to use my two encycloductors, superior oblique and superior rectus. I hope that they will balance each other, depression and elevation, the oblique being a depressor, the erectus being an elevator. But since the superior oblique is weak, it is, cannot balance the elevating effect of the superior rectus, and the eye elevates. And that elevation of an eye when you tilt your head to one side is a diagnostic example of a superior, a better, a better test of a superior oblique paralysis than is even the one that we discussed here. And it works for the inferior ob oblique as well. Let's say I had an inferior oblique paralysis on the right side. If I tilt my head to the opposite side, so my left ear is near my left shoulder, I need to use my right-sided x cycloductors, inferior oblique, inferior rectus. The inferior oblique will elevate, the inferior rectus will depress, and that would normally cancel out. But if I have a weak inferior oblique, it will be overwhelmed by the depression of the inferior rectus, and the eye will depress. So those are positive Bielshawski head tilt tests. The eye moves up or down when you tilt your head to one side or the other, and you have to decide which, as, and that's an, a, a, the best test for oblique muscle paralysis that there is. And here's just an example. This is, would be the result in our person who had the right superior oblique paralysis of a Bilshowski head tilt test. They tilt their head so their right ear touches their right shoulder, and we see an elevation of the right eye under the action of the superior rectus, not uh, balanced by the superior oblique. Yes. All right, I said the same thing here. Yeah. Do you actually end up seeing the latter case because um, the IO and the IR should be innervated by the superior oh, nerve? Katie said, you, you know, will you ever, I mean, this, this is superior oblique paralysis is obviously due to uh, damage in the trochlear nerve. Katie asked the question, do you ever see an isolated inferior oblique? And because the oculomotor nerve innervates both of them. And the answer is, yes, you do, but not as commonly, and not due necessarily to nerve injuries, but to independent injuries of the inferior oblique muscle. Uh, but it's not as common, uh, certainly, as a superior oblique problem. Head posture. When people have a strabismus and experience a diplopia as a result of it, a double vision, they will, if they can, do almost anything to avoid it. Double vision makes you sick to your stomach and vomit and things like that. So if there's a way to position your head to avoid the double vision, you will do it. A person like that young girl who had a lateral rectus paralysis, let's, I can't remember which side it was, I guess it was her left side. So she had a lateral rectus paralysis on her left side. And that means that normally her left eye will be medially deviated a little bit. It'll turn in because the lateral rectus is paralyzed. That means the left eye is sort of looking over there towards Samaya, all right? But my right eye is looking straight ahead, and I will have double vision. So what I want to do if I want to talk to Samaya is stand like this. And now my left eye and right eye are both pointing at her. That's called when you see a person who talks to you without looking at you. You know, just, how are you doing there? Well, you're Alexander, right? How are you doing, Alex? Is everything going okay? Uh -huh. All right. <laughs> that's general, that's, they adopt that because they, one of the eyes turned in and the other one has to be brought out actively so they can look at the same object. In a case of a person with a paralyzed superior oblique, let's say I had a right paralyzed superior oblique, or, or weak, actually it's really more true, people with paralysis. The eye is going to be depressed a little. That's uh, sorry, elevated a little. That's true. But the eye is also going to be excycloducted a little. Because if you have a paralyzed superior oblique, not only are you losing its depression effect, but you're losing its encycloducting effect. So the eye will be a little elevated and a little excycloducted. And you will actually position your head like that. You will position your head in what is a position where you would normally if you had normal muscles, if you held your head like this, you would want the right eye to excycloduct. 
because you remember you have that counter rotation. So if the right eye is excycloducted for abnormal reasons, you tilt your head a little like that and put your head in a position where that abnormal excycloduction is actually quite fine. It's what you would have done if it had been normal. So people with these superior oblique paralysis and also with isolated inferior oblique paralysis tilt their head to one side. And that position is called, it's called ocular torticollis. Torticollis means twisting of the neck. I had another student who, in fact, went home for Thanksgiving and diagnosed his uncle with a <laughs> superior oblique paralysis because his uncle always sat and, you know, talked with everybody tilted his head like that. So you can go home and, and diagnose people at Thanksgiving, too. <laughs> and so now this, is, this stuff, you know, you got to think about this stuff. You can't just try and memorize this stuff. You have to think about it and understand it, or you won't be able to conduct a proper exam of, of the eyes. And then the final thing, which is just here for fun. How can you do that? I don't know. I have control of my eye muscles. How long have you been able to do that? For about 10 years now. Can you do it again? She can do this. This is not, you know, blowing up a balloon behind her eyeballs. You know, she has muscles that are doing this. And you should be able to figure out what are the only two muscles acting in concert that could pull your eyeball forward out of the socket. You and I don't have the ability to contract them at the same time, but she obviously does. And you'll think about it in, in, in lab. If you can't figure it out, we can discuss it. <laughs> <laughs>